This episode of the Creep Street Podcast is brought to you by Martini Coffee Roasters. You know, people always look at me weird when I say I start off every morning with a big old martini. But then I set them straight and I tell them I'm talking about Martini Coffee Roasters Coffee. A delicious coffee made by the Martini family. They roast their coffee using a traditional method of sight and sound to roast those little babies to perfection. And they also sell green coffee beans for those home roasters out there. And right now, fans of the Creep Street podcast can get 20% off their entire order by using the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Once again, for 20% off your order, use the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Martini Coffee Roasters, the perfect coffee to keep you creeps caffeinated. You've taken a wrong turn. Down Creep Street. Citizens of the Milky Way, this is Maureen Bogey. And this is Dylan Hackworth. And you are listening to what? Excuse me? Huh? That's right. Creep Street podcast get it in your brain let me tell you something it's gonna get stuck in your head Mm -hmm. you're gonna be thinking dreaming craving creep street every second every hour of every day absolutely whoa wow we are so happy to have you here today everybody i mean what a thrill we are gonna have a blast and if you picked up on my Alan Partridge reference, oh, yes. please give us a shout out. Mm-hmm. We love Alan Partridge. Amen. Our British folks listening know what we're talking about. Our American folks, you might not. Just give it a damn Google. Oh, yeah. YouTube Alan Partridge. You'll love it. All right. Now, once again, thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. If you are a fan of the program, we humbly ask you to like rate, subscribe, leave a review, post about us on social media, anything like that. Oh, yeah. Speaking of social media, we've got a few accounts. Oh, yeah. All right. You can follow us on Instagram at Creep Street Podcast, Twitter at Creep Street Pod. You can follow us on TikTok at Creep Street Podcast. We're on Facebook as well. And on our Facebook, we have a subgroup called Citizens of the Milky Way. It's a little fan page. Feel free to get in there, interact, and post some fun stuff. Now, currently, Creep Street releases episodes once a week. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm told. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, we have been told time and time again that that's just not enough. Nay. The people need more Creep Street. Mm -hmm. So we, what do we do? We provide. Absolutely. We provide, and you can check that out, that bonus content, over at patreon.com slash creep street podcast amen baby we have got all sorts of bonus content out there we're talking movie reviews short stories conversations interviews full blown i'm talking full blown bonus episodes you know what i'm talking about amen i mean we're getting weird we're getting wild and we're having a blast over there once again that's at patreon.com slash creep street podcast i like it now, first of all, a huge thank you to everyone for being for being understanding with my little voice last week. But she's back, baby. I'm feeling much better now. Was it sickness? Was it allergies? We'll literally never know. Yeah. There's just no way to find out. But you know what? Doing better this week. So thanks for the kind words, everyone. And thank you to listening to our High Strangeness in Appalachia episode last week. We have heard a lot of wonderful feedback from it we're so glad you enjoyed listening to the episode and a few people have uh reached out to let us know that they do have some spooky stories from appalachia can't wait to hear about those so feel free to send those over to us on any of our socials or you can email us at creepstreetpodcast at gmail.com. Oh, yeah. And we accept those those stories at all times, of course. But just a little reminder we mentioned last week, we're already prepping for our next listener stories episode. So even if you have some personal stories that have nothing to do with Appalachia. Right. We want to hear about them. Amen, we do. So, you know, if you have a connection to a true crime case, if you've 
seen a ghost, if you have seen a damn goblin, I don't know, anything. We want to hear about it. Once again, DM us, email us. We're going to love it. Absolutely. So Dylan. Yeah. What what are we talking about today? I mean, what are the vibes? Like, what's going on? Ooh. Well, just so the listeners at home know, you might hear a little tinkle tinkle of ice in a glass. Oh, wow. That's because Papa has poured himself a little bit of good old Kentucky bourbon. Oh, come on. We're having fun. With a couple ice cubes. Oh, yeah. It's because this is one of those episodes. Yeah. This is an episode where you gotta release your inhibitions. That's right. This one is gonna take us on a damn ride. Mm -hmm. Folks, if you got a whiskey, pour it. You got some wine, pour it. You got a joint, light it. If you're sober, enjoy an iced tea. Absolutely. Open the window. Yeah. Put a blanket over you. Whatever you got to do, this is the time to get in the mindset. Oh, yeah, because this is a wacky. This is one we're getting. I mean, we cover the strange every week. Oh, yeah. This is very strange. Okay, let's go. This week, we are talking about entities with invisibility cloaks. That's right, folks. Now, let me spank your ass oh God. with some of my sources real quick before I give us a little a little prelude mm. to what we're talking about. All right. First off, one of my sources was a video called Cloaking Technology. How close are we to making something invisible by the Science of Science Fiction channel on YouTube? Uh, it was hosted by Simon Whistler. Folks don't know Simon Whistler. He does a lot of stuff on YouTube. He's that guy. He's fr- He's English. Uh, he's got oh, the beard yes. and the glasses. We enjoy his stuff. He d- he covers a whole range. Sometimes he'll do supernatural topics, or he'll mm-hmm. do like historical topics, or like you know topics on engineering and science and stuff like a lot. that. Just kind of anything, really. Because before we get into the spooky stuff, we're going to talk about actual right. technology mm-hmm. that is actually pretty damn impressive when oh, it comes yeah. to invisibility cloaks. Next is an article called Strange Real Encounters with Invisibility Cloaked Predator Entities by Brent Swanser at Mysterious Universe. And Invisibility, Bizarre Accounts from Conspiracies to Cryptozoology and More by Nick Redfern at Mysterious Universe. Now, folks, I want to clarify something. Obviously, we talk about invisible entities all the time, whether it's ghosts or or what have you. Oh, yeah. But I'm excited to dive in here and unpack this because just to be clear, we're not talking about invisible entities like ghosts, Mm -hmm. et cetera. What you think of as ghosts being, you know, obviously ghosts can appear as real as you or I or they can be invisible. You know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is about entities that literally use a cloaking device Mm -hmm. to become invisible. Yes, And wow, these specters are said to be many things. Some are humans. Perhaps some are government actors. Maybe some are extraterrestrials with technology to do so. Some are said to even be interdimensional travelers with the ability to cloak themselves. And some say, God damn it, that even Bigfoot himself can cloak. Oh, f***. Bigfoot. Bigfoot. You... you, I'm not even kidding. Mr. Foot. The big guy that lives in either Pacific Northwest or Appalachia or many places say they got him, but that's the one you're talking about? Yes. Mr. Foot. Fuck. First name Big. Yeah. Now, before we dive into the paranormal aspect, as I said, let's start with the actual science that we know of that's actually being worked on by various scientific communities, militaries, and whatnot, because that alone is pretty damn impressive. Oh, yeah. It's kind of, it's crazy to see. So let's break down these different types of actual real world invisibility cloaks. So you're probably not surprised. Science has for decades been working to create what is essentially an invisibility cloak and they're actually getting pretty damn close. Mm -hmm. They have made it possible to make smaller objects invisible but now it's just essentially a matter of scaling it outwards, Mm -hmm. making it bigger and more effective. Now, obviously I'm not an expert in this stuff. No. I'm not going to give you a 100% rundown of everything that's happening in the science world in regards to this stuff. I mean, who could? I'm going to give you kind of an overview of what's going on before we jump into the paranormal stuff. All right, here we go. So first, there is the Rochester Cloak. 
In the race to create an invisibility cloak, the first real step forward was what is known as the Rochester Cloak, or the Hal Choi Cloaking Device. It was named after physics professor Ron Howell and his graduate student Joseph Choi from the University of Rochester. So essentially, the main ingredient of an effective cloaking device is the ability to bend light around an object. The Rochester Cloak does this by using a series of four regular lenses that you would buy, you know, like for a camera. Mm -hmm. And they are placed at precise intervals. So if you look through the end of the first lens, the object on the other side of the fourth lens will be rendered almost entirely invisible. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, each of these lenses would fit into the palm of your hand. And to render an object invisible, it needs to be placed perfectly at the other end of the fourth lens. Now, theoretically, you could increase this effect by just increasing the size of the lenses, but obviously the lenses themselves are still visible. Right. And to actually render an object invisible, it has to be placed in just the right spot and viewed at just the right angle to Mm -hmm. be invisible. So that means it it wouldn't be practical for like, say like how the military would want to use it. Right, you're not really going to be able to like trick someone exactly it's very impressive but oh in terms of practical use you know and also for a lot of what we're talking about here too just in case you got a little confused which is totally understandable because of society and the zeitgeist it's so easy to think of invisibility cloaks as literally like a cloak like harry potter right like literally like it's a cape yes and that's not what this Cloak is kind of a wider term. Absolutely. So just want to make that clear. We will talk about one that that was created in Japan that's actually kind of similar to that. But Mm -hmm. we'll get to that. But no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So invisibility shields. That's the next level. Okay. So an invisibility shield is exactly what it sounds like. It's a kind of a rounded piece of material that essentially renders what is behind it invisible for the most part. These shields are made up of a large assortment of lenticular lenses. This is the same technology used on things such as like posters and trading cards where oh, if yes. you if you look at it from one angle, it looks like something else. Mm-hmm. You look at it from another angle, you know, it looks like something else. Yeah. But the lenticular lenses in these shields are arranged in such a way that light that hits the outer edge of the shield is then redirected to the viewer, which effectively makes anything behind the shield appear invisible. And just like the Rochester cloak, invisibility shields are limited in how they can actually be used. Obviously, the shield is only effective when viewed head on. If you walk around on either side of it, you will quickly see what is being hidden. So obviously, once again, for military purposes, mm-hmm. what have you, it's it, it doesn't really work. But right. I mean, it's still very impressive, a step in the right direction, but it's, you know, we're not there yet. Exactly. Yeah. But the shields actually have an additional problem as well. The shield itself is visible. So even if you can't see what's behind it, you'll know it's hiding something because you can see the shield. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. So say you're on the battlefield and an em- enemy soldier sees the shield, well, they're just going to know, well, there's some fucker they're behind like, it. Well, let's get behind that damn shield. Absolutely. Okay. Mm, Next is optical camouflage. Ooh. Optical camouflage is what is known as active camouflage in that it can rapidly adapt to many different surroundings. The theory behind it is this. Essentially, you have a camera recording what is behind you or whatever object it is you want to conceal. It then projects forward what the camera shows. Now, as with the other methods, a lot of this camo's effectiveness relies on being viewed from a specific point. Obviously, it works best when an object is stationary. When a person or object moves, there is a delay between the camera input and the projected display. So you'll still see something weird going Mm, on. Yeah. In 2003, now this is where we're talking about where it's actually kind of cloak-like. In 2003, the University of Tokyo unveiled an invisibility cloak of sorts using this technology. Now, the results were not really effective, but what they did create was actually kind of cool from just a visual standpoint. Now, the cloak itself and the shape of the person wearing it were still visible, but the people themselves kind of take on a transparent look very similar to what you might imagine a a ghost to look like. You can still see them, you can see their outline, but you can kind of see through them, which is kind of cool. Like, even if it's not practical for, let's be real here, it's militaries that fucking want this shit all around the world, not just every military. So let's be real here. 
but for just fun, like, you know, yeah, kind of cool looking stuff, yeah. you can kind of see it and the person, but like you see through them. It's really kind of cool. Yeah. Um, All of this really reminds me of Invisible Man, the new the new Invisible Man and movie. And we will talk about that, actually. Oh, I'm very. glad you brought that up. <gasps> Yay. So my source actually takes time to show how Toyota is actually planning on using optical camouflage in their cars to improve safety. So, for example, the source talked about the A pillars that stand on either side of a car's dashboard. It's the thing. Oh, yes. It just comes up. It's based the shell of the car. And it does kind of get in the way. Right. Well, obviously, they've made them thicker and more sturdy out of safety for the driver and the people in the car. But it kind of has hindered, you know, your viewpoints and whatnot. Especially when you're turning. It's kind of a whole, it kind of sucks. Yeah. Well, they're hoping to use this active camouflage to essentially, you would still get the safety of the thicker, sturdier A pillars, but you would be able to see more because you would be able to see through it. That's a great idea. A very interesting and practical use for this stuff. Yes. Now let's talk about meta materials. Okay. The definition of meta materials is simple and reads as such. Meta materials are any material engineered to have a property that is not found naturally occurring. So it doesn't occur in nature. Materials okay. that don't occur in nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These materials are designed to take certain frequencies of light from behind an object and direct it around the object in such a way that this light will arrive at the same time as other light hitting the object. This would make the object invisible in that wavelength of light. And if you're able to coat an object in this, it would essentially effectively become invisible from any vantage point, 360 degrees up and down. Mm -hmm. Research into metamaterials actually began back in the 19th century. But as you can imagine, the study was largely then theoretical. But serious research into this technology has only really started about 20 years ago. But some further breakthroughs have been made, such as meta lenses. One of the biggest roadblocks to creating invisibility is making sure that the affected light still arrives at the object at the same time as all the rest of the light does. Meta lenses are meant to deal with this problem. They're designed to focus a wide spectrum of light and focus it to a single point. This was a big improvement, but still not what the goal was. So the big problem up until now was that all these metamaterials were affecting wavelengths of light that we actually can't even detect, such as infrared light and radio waves. Oh. Well, then a big breakthrough came in, which was titanium nanofins. What titanium nanofins do is direct the wavelengths of light into different parts of the lenses to ensure that all the different wavelengths will arrive at the same time. This was a huge step forward. Before, the metamaterials were only effective with light that the human eye couldn't even see. But now with titanium nanofins, two-thirds of visible light frequencies are affected. So I'm glad you brought up Invisible Man. Yes. In the original Invisible Man, like the old H.G. Wells book and then the old 1932 film Mm -hmm. with Gloria Stewart, a wonderful film, one of my favorites, he was like a mad scientist and he did it using like chemistry. Yeah. He, he was a chemist. He did it with, you know, he whipped up some sort of formula and did it. Some damn potions. Also love the 2020 Invisible Man. Love the new one. The one with what's-her-face? Elizabeth Moss. Elizabeth Moss. Excellent film. And what's super cool about that is the the madman, the, the uh, like, the abusive boyfriend or whomever he was. Husband, I think. Or he, is it a boyfriend? I, I can't think remember. they were, bo- I can't remember, but... He worked in optics. He was a scientist in terms of optics. And what's kind of cool is the suit used cameras and Mm -hmm. like lenses and all these things to create the invisible effect, which is super cool because it's kind of in terms of of science fiction, it's actually pretty close to what it might be once it fully is created. Mm -hmm. It was actually a pretty good, really smart concept and really played into modern science and stuff. I thought it was a great, if you haven't seen it, I really recommend you see it. It's very good. Exactly. Really fun. Oh, what an amazing movie. Mm -hmm. But now let's dive into the paranormal aspect of today's episode. Oh, fuck. All right. Okay. And to kick us off, we are starting with none other than Coast to Coast AM. Come on, kings and queens. Let's go. Well, it was October 26th, 2014, when Coast to Coast AM got a caller who had quite an incredible story to tell. The caller said their name was Greg and that they were calling from Dobson, North Carolina. And they shared a story that happened to them back in, it was around 1993, 1994. At the time, Greg was living in Nashville, Tennessee. 
It was the evening and he was out walking his dog when he got the undeniable feeling of being watched, like someone was staring daggers at him. This is what Greg says happened next. I started looking at some woods, down in the woods directly in front of me, and I couldn't see anything, but I could hear leaves rustling in the trees. So I started looking up towards the top of the trees, and I had very good eyesight at the time. I didn't do drugs, I didn't drink, I saw something crouched down in the tops of the trees. The only way I could describe it, and I don't even know if the movie had come out yet, so I, I didn't know anything about it, but the movie Predator, where they saw that invisible creature. You could see the outline of everything, but you could see right through it. And it was sitting up in the very tops of the trees where it wouldn't hold the weight of a man by any means. This thing was as big as a man. I just stood there looking up at it, and then I let go of the leash, and I took off at a dead run, and I yelled, Hey! And I took off running towards this thing, and it started running across the tops of the trees. It ran the length of a football field in just no time at all. I mean, it was really fast. I don't know how it was running across the tops of the trees, but I know what I saw. After I thought about it, I thought, what in the world are you doing chasing this thing? I stopped, and it stopped, about the length of a football field away from where I started, and it turned around and looked at me again. And then it took off through the woods, through the tops of the trees, out into the woods, and I didn't see it again. It scared the hell out of me. I know that. And I never, ever told anybody about it because I thought people would think I was as crazy as a loon. So, damn. So, what's interesting, so yes, the movie Predator was already out by then. Mm -hmm. But as we all know, and by the way, a lot of our stories are about these predator like entities, almost sometimes like folks are being hunted. Now, what's interesting is the effect of you could still see it, the outline, but it was invisible. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting. And how it could run across the treetops. Now, barring supernatural means, Perhaps this cloak also somehow makes things lighter. I know in that video I used as a source, the one Simon Whistler did, he did mention at the end that, you know, they're obviously working on full invisibility. And that doesn't mean just 100% you can't see them. That means you couldn't hear them. Mm. Or if you even were to put your hand where they are, you wouldn't feel them. That's insane. That to me, that's just like, well, are you just crossing into another dimension? Yeah, it's like, what something? is that even? What? It, what? Is, where are you? But it's interesting to think about that now when I hear this story because it seems like this thing, mm-hmm. even though it was the size of a person, was light enough to walk across treetops like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, yes. or something. You know what I mean? So very interesting. I don't know if that has to do with the invisibil- invisibility effects. Right. Right. I also just like that he he referred to things as being as as long as a football field. Right. Because that's just so relatable. It's like we could say 100 yards. But yes. I do that all the time, too. I always say a football field. Just well, relatable. It, it, America. Good times. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. But, yes, very scary. And it's interesting. It's like, how do we know when it, it is this creature is just able to become invisible yes. versus it's using something to become invisible. You know what I mean? And that's the question. Yeah. Like, is this just part of this creature's abilities? Yeah. Or is it utilizing a technology? Right, right, is right. Is the question. And that's kind of what I want to do with this episode. We're not talk. I'm trying to focus on things where we're not talking about things that are invisible. Right. Or can become invisible. I mean, they can, but we're talking about entities that are utilizing a technology. And are they really entities as in not human? Maybe they are human. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Now, it would seem like this story would be, you know, sounds pretty wild for sure, but Greg seemed very sincere on the call, and on top of that, there are other reports out there that are very similar to what Greg experienced. The next encounter is similar, and it was posted to Reddit by a user who claims she was only five years old at the time of her encounter. But what's interesting about this encounter is that it would be just the first encounter of many that she would experience in her life. This is what she remembers of that first encounter as a young girl. I was playing by the edge of the woods behind my grandma's house. I played there often and my grandpa just kept an eye on me from the kitchen or living room because the house had huge windows that faced the woods. She would come out every once in a while just to see what I was up to, 
I was obsessed with digging in the dirt and collecting unusual rocks and arrowheads that littered the land where my grandmother lived. I should mention that this is Midwest Illinois, not far from the Cahokia Mouths. So, finding arrowheads that was actually not that uncommon. Anyway, that day I remember picking out a spot to dig. I'd been out there for quite a while because I remember I had a pretty decent size hole going when something caught my eye in the tree that I was next to. I almost don't know how to explain it, but it looked almost like a heat wave coming off the branch of the tree. It was fall. I remember this because I had my pink jacket on and I remember thinking that my mom was going to be pissed because I had dirt around the bottom of the arms from digging. I also remember there being a lot of leaves on the ground. Anyway, I'm staring at this heat wave and I realize it has a human shape. So here I am, five years old and wondering why there is an invisible man in the tree. I remember feeling scared but unsure what to do. Then it started moving and making a faint clicking sound. This is about the time that I decided that I was not supposed to be seeing this, and I hightailed it back to the house. My grandmother saw that I was pretty shaken, and I remember telling her that I had just seen an angel. In my five-year-old mind, I didn't know what else it could be. I had never heard of aliens or ghosts or monsters, so to me, it had to be an angel because that's all my little mind could think of. Interesting that once again, it's in a tree, too. Yeah, that is interesting. All of these stories, or both of these stories so far, kind of are reminding me a little bit of Skinwalker Ranch. It does, yes. And I don't really know why exactly, because as far as I remember, I don't think there was anything exactly like this that did happen there. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, maybe it's something to do with just like being out in wilderness or, you know, and not that this is complete wilderness, but, you know, being out more so in nature or something that makes me think of it. I I don't know, but I wonder what that was. Yeah. The heat wave kind of element. That was a very good way to describe it. Yes. Because I know exactly what she's talking about. Like, it feels like she you could see the heat. Yes. It's a good way of describing it. You're right. Yeah. Hmm. Well, this Reddit poster goes on to tell of another time that this same entity paid her a visit in 2004 once she was a grown adult. Life at this time was not going so easy as she had just separated from her husband. She was living in a new place that was on the outskirts of town, right at the edge of the woods, and here's what she says happened. One night, I was up late doing laundry and stuff after the kids went to bed. I decided to take a smoke break before I myself went to sleep. I'm back there on the porch and I started hearing this faint clicking sound. I immediately looked to the ditch because I had seen a groundhog out there a few days before and thought perhaps he was out there again. The yard is faintly lit from the outside light that is by the playground that is just to the right of my back porch. I didn't turn on my porch light. I didn't normally if I was just going out for a quick smoke. I didn't see any groundhog or movement from the ditch, so I got back to smoking my cigarette. The faint clicking sound keeps happening, and a slight shift of movement makes me look up into the tree to the left of my porch. It's there. The same invisible thing I had seen when I was five. It's like a distortion and in a humanoid shape. It's crouched down on the branch with an arm out holding on to the trunk of the tree. I couldn't believe it. I was like, is this happening? Has it come to kill me for seeing it all those years ago? All I could think about was my kids in the apartment sleeping. I ran in and slammed and locked the door. I ran to the kids' rooms and made sure all the windows were locked. Then I just turned out the lights in the living room and stared out the blinds at the tree to see if I could catch another glimpse of it. I sat there for about a good 10 minutes and couldn't see anything. I began to think that I was just tired and my mind was playing tricks on me. Just as I was finally talking myself down, my neighbor's dog comes running across the yard and starts barking at the tree at the same branch that I had seen this predator thing. That pretty much freaked me out because this dog was not a barker. I actually have never heard him bark at anything, even at the groundhog that had been hanging out at the ditch. This barking went on for a few minutes until I heard the neighbor lady who owns the dog call him back inside. The dog reluctantly turned to go back home, stopping every few feet to look back at the branch of the tree until he was out of my sight. I didn't sleep that night and have never seen anything like it again. So that's interesting because why would it come back to her Hmm. in a new place? She's at a different part in life. But it's funny, though, because that kind of thing happens a lot, they say, with with UFO encounters. You're very right. You're very right. 
almost like you get tagged, like with a how we'll mm-hmm. put like how scientists they'll put like a little chip in the in a duck, and then yeah. they can follow its migration patterns and all mm-hmm. that stuff. It's almost like that. Almost like maybe that's what it is. Maybe they aren't even hostile. It's more like you know the way we would study a shark, a shark, or you, you know. Yeah, and also honestly, similar stuff with like hauntings too, with like ghosts and stuff. Like yeah, certain people seem to either be drawn to it or it is drawn to them exactly like they just ha- like they are something about them i don't know what it is but for whatever reason they are more prone to having this paranormal activity right and maybe this is a similar thing where maybe she's just open to it or or there's i don't know something about her exactly that that makes her be able to to see these things or makes this thing want to see her i don't know right Well, there's another Reddit post, this one by a policeman who lives in western Washington state. One night, he was out on patrol trying to spot some drug dealers in the area that they had been kind of working for a while to capture, but they had, you know, evaded them. But that evening, he would be encountering something far different than mere drug dealers. He was making his way through a thick patch of trees in the forest with his rifle ready, just in case. That's when something weird happened. Here's what he had to say. It began in late July, when I was forced to make semi-regular patrols around the property on which I live, heavily wooded, very hilly, and wet with a creek and swamp at the bottom, when I was made aware of local drug addicts attempting incursions upon the property. I began carrying a rifle as I made my patrols because, as the old adage puts it, better safe than sorry. Very quickly, I found their tracks at the bottom of the hill, and I even managed to claim a gas can as a kind of war trophy. That led me to believe they may be aiming to perform illegal logging on the property, which intensified my patrols. Soon after, I ran into a rather unsettling shape in the forest. I was on another patrol, standard, routine procedure, when I passed an ancient cedar tree. I'd been past it a million and a half times, but I suddenly felt as though I should take a seat underneath it and rest a while. I sat down under the tree's boughs and set my rifle and day pack at my side. I sat in the silence and stillness for a while, taking in all the sounds the woods had to offer. I almost felt as though I had entertained the same state of zen I had the year previously, kneeling beside a natural spring after heavy rain. All was well, the world was fine, and everything would be okay. I felt wonderful. I opened my eyes and rolled my head to the right to look out into a grove of old alder trees. Glancing upwards, I saw a humanoid shape. It was roughly 15 feet up in the air and had the distinct shape of a human head, neck, and shoulders, but no discernible bottom. It just seemed to fade away. The only way I can describe it is similar to the Predator films, in which the titular creature uses a cloaking device. It was very, very similar to the device. At its edges, it seemed reality itself was embossed in that shape. I sat and stared at it for probably about three to five seconds before an overwhelming feeling of dread and anxiety overtook me. I should add that I'm very tough to genuinely scare. I've been through a great many nasty situations that don't bear mentioning, and suffice to say that this shook me to my very core. I was almost petrified, scared out of my mind of what would happen if I dare move. I finally mustered the strength to remove my glasses and wipe them on my shirt and redawning them, I could see the shape was still there. The dread grew in intensity tenfold every few seconds, and my natural, calm, rational mind took hold again, and I began counting down in my head. The same Reddit user actually continues their story. A few days later, they went back to the spot where they had first encountered what happened. And when he went back, he discovered a strange hole in the ground that was shaped like the letter L. Huh. And all around it were large, strange scratches. Now, what's even weirder is that when he got close to the hole, it would suddenly get very windy without explanation. He added further detail, saying, The hole is at the bottom of a ravine filled with large, old growth trees. It suddenly got terribly windy when I was there. If stormy days are anything to compare, I would say the winds were reaching 30 to 40 miles an hour at the bottom of a ravine filled with wind-blocking trees. Temperatures that felt like it dropped about 20 degrees as well. I've been back since, but not often. Each time I visit, I say aloud that whatever is there does not have my permission to come with me back to my house, and most assuredly, nowhere else I go. So smart thinking there. Smart. That's actually not a bad idea. 
once again in the trees. Interesting that it all that it, it's happening with the damn trees. Yeah. Why are they always hanging in the fucking trees? There's got to be something there. I wonder what that is about. Like, do these things live in the trees, maybe? Or in the woods or the forest? Or do they travel through the woods? I don't know. Now, it's funny. It makes me think, even though this is entirely different, it takes me back to our episode, the two-part episode we did on the house that screamed. Mm. Remember the things in the trees? It was like a baby hanging from the trees. Oh, my God. Now, that was something entirely different. But it just makes me think of the thing that came out of the tree and chased him to their car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very freaky stuff. Check out that episode if you haven't. Yes, please. Very freaky haunting episode. Well, this next report comes from an organization called MUFON, which stands for Mutual UFO Network. Shout out to Christopher Damien Damaris, one of our listeners and Patreon supporters. He posts a lot in our, uh, our, our Facebook forum, Citizens Great. of the Milky Way. He posts a lot of MUFON articles and stuff. Very cool stuff. And we're glad he's there. And we're, we're so thrilled to have him as a listener. Yes, thank you so much. But when I saw this, it made me think of the Conqueror. Of course. So this story happened to a woman living in Brighton, England in July of 1988. It was evening, and the witness happened to be in bed asleep. Suddenly, she awakes from her sleep with a sort of spasm sensation coursing through her body. Well, terror flooded her veins when she realized she was completely paralyzed. Mm. She would later describe it as if something had crawled on top of her and was sitting on her chest. We've heard this before. Many times. With hands clasped around her throat. Mm. That's when she heard what sounded like a breathing and a growling in her ear. Her eyes were the only thing she could move. This, according to the Post, is what happened next to this woman. Okay. She could just make out a large, long head next to her face. And as the spasm-like feeling started to wear off a tiny bit at a time, she could see that this figure that was on top of her was like a lizard, newt-like creature. It was like blending in with all that was around it, or maybe invisible. The the witness was not sure, but she could see it more clearly as the seconds passed. It was reptilian. The witness thinks she growled at it and bared her teeth at it, and she could feel that it could read her mind, and she began swearing at it and shouting all sorts of vengeance at it. She felt violated and used. The next thing, which was very quick, it was off her and was standing to one side of the bottom of her bunk bed, which she had at the time, and a light came through the thin gap which was made by the curtains. The light was of a different shade of golden light, which also had very small particles in it, like dust or very small specks, which moved around like little bright lights. The reptilian creature stood there. It was about six feet high, and the witness could feel that it was either proud or happy, maybe both. She tried to sit up as best she could, and she spat at it, but the spit just went down her chin, and through her mind, she swore again. The creature walked forward and stepped into the light beam. As it did, the feet and then the legs vanished into the light. The more the creature moved forward towards the window, the more it vanished. When it was gone, the witness felt relaxed, but she could still feel where she was held around her throat. Wow. Very creepy, and the story goes on to say that she feels like she was sexually assaulted Jesus. by this thing. Now, this is interesting because it's not in a fucking tree. Right, yeah. This sounds more like what we think of when we think of hat man or mm-hmm. shadow people, yeah. this uh, idea of the thing on your chest, like the old hang yes. or something. And then, unfortunately, she says, feels as though this thing sexually assaulted her. But also, this time she describes it as almost reptilian. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is maybe those first, from the first stories, maybe that thing was reptilian also. They just weren't close enough right, to yeah. see it. And the Predator in the Predator movies, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an alien, but it does, you know, it's kind of has, you know, like a reptilian-like, mm-hmm. beastly-like affect to it. Yeah. But I, mean, I just think very interesting. Yeah. This adds a lot more to it than the others did. Because this is a obviously a very close encounter. Yes. Oh, my God. And it makes me think about a few things. And, well, first of all, it's strange because this really does sound a lot like, like you said, like a sleep paralysis, sleep demon, hat man kind of situation. Right. But usually they don't actually harm you, it seems. Right. With shadow people and things like that. It's they more scare so, the shit out of you. They scare you. So that's very different. But then also two things that also stood out to me. When she described this thing as being reptilian, I was like, chameleons. 
Right, yes, we know that was another thing I was going to say. Yes, there are certain lizards that have the ability to camouflage Camouflage, themselves. Yes, of course. So maybe, I don't know, is there something there? I don't know. And then it also made me think of that damn monster in Monsters, Inc., Oh, oh yeah, the villain. He was like the. It was that in the first one. The like. Yeah, he's like a reptile guy. I he's can't like remember. A snake, kind of. Because who or are the two? Like it's Sully and was it Mike or the two? Mike Wazowski, of course. Mike, right, the two. Speak, speak his name. You know, I haven't seen Monsters Inc. in a while. Unfortunately, need to you know rewatch. But yeah, it's like the damn reptile guy that can become invisible. Yes. This next encounter comes from Mufan as well, and it happened in Bloomfield, Michigan in the summer of 2001. Now, the witness says they were only 10 years old at the time, and they were out with friends that day playing with airsoft guns by the river. Now, if anyone has ever paintballed before, you know, they're kind of playing in that way. There's two teams, they split up, and then they hunt each other. The witness in question was playing, you know, with their friends, and they were hiding in some brush, waiting to jump out when someone from the opposing team walked by. So he's hiding and waiting and listening carefully for someone approaching, and after some time, he hears something. He can hear the sound of someone approaching through the brush. Well, he thinks it's one of his friends, so he looks, but doesn't see anyone. Yet he can still hear what sounds like someone approaching. That's when he noticed branches on trees were even moving aside as if, you know, how you would walk through the woods and you would push something aside to walk Mm -hmm. through. It was like that, but he couldn't see anybody, but he could see the branches kind of move Mm -hmm. aside. Very scary. He even watched as the grass seemed to move like someone was stepping on it. Mm. Well, curious, the boy moved closer to the sound and was shocked to see branches even snapping as if someone was walking right by him. He blinked as he stared intently at the area of the sound, trying to see anything, and that's when suddenly he could see what looked like a vague outline of something that stood over eight feet tall and had an oval-shaped head. The body was completely translucent, and only a vague outline was visible from certain angles. The source describes it as looking almost like a faint hologram was the term they used. Hmm. Well, the boy is surprised, and he shouts in fright. And when he did, the entity apparently crouched down in what looked almost like an attack stance. And for a few moments, it stared directly at the frightened boy. The creature then apparently made some strange noises and then quickly dashed off to a nearby tree line and out of sight. And while the boy would never directly see this entity again, he claimed that in the years to come, he would occasionally hear those growling noises in the forests around his house. And even a few years later, he claimed to have witnessed a black, triangle-shaped UFO that had three orange-reddish lights fly directly over his house before shooting off into the sky at incredible speed. Now, here we go. Once again, though he didn't see it again, Mm -hmm. he claims he heard those noises later in life, which would suggest this thing kind of following him. Not even following him like, I want you, but just kind of like observing him. Yeah, yeah. Then we add in the fun ingredients of this black triangle UFO. Now, Mm -hmm. this was a few years after. Who knows if the two things are similar, if they're even related. Right. But it's something think to think about. It's it's like, I feel like they very well could be related to uh, each right. other. I mean, they're both incredibly, incredibly rare and bizarre experiences. Right. So even though they might not seem like they have anything to do with one another at, from just first glance, I don't know. A lot of this stuff is, it does kind of make me wonder if maybe some of this is extraterrestrial related. Like, Perhaps. Like they're just coming down to observe. And, you know, and they, you know, are more advanced than we are with technology. So they already have developed this technology to have invisibility cloaks. Yeah. That are better than what we can do. Absolutely. So maybe that's what's happening. The the revisiting people. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I could see it. Now, while we can't know for sure that the entity the boy encountered was related to the UFO he saw, there have been reports of these things that we do know were attached to UFOs. Oh, okay. One of these encounters happened in 2008 to two boys living in Sao Paulo, Brazil, whose names were Denilson and Rafael. They were out playing in the Sebastian's Chapel Square of Jardinopolis when they happened to see these bright, rotating red and blue lights moving over the square towards a nearby field. They watched as it seemed to even start descending lower like it was going to land. 
So panicked, the boys grab some of their friends, and this group of boys cautiously approached the field, and they saw that these strange lights were hovering above the ground. But what was even weirder was that they saw what looked like translucent, almost invisible entities crouched in the field beneath the lights. Milton Dino Frank Jr., the president of the Center of Ufology in Brazil, had this to say of the encounter. The creatures were crouching in a horseshoe or U formation and appeared to be communicating with each other. The boys were extremely frightened since they had never seen anything like that before. And the boys were convinced that the creatures were not animals since their behavior was totally different from that of typical farm animals that abounded in the area. The boys explained that the creatures were well-defined, but when they changed their viewing angle, were able to see up to four or five creatures, giving some of the creatures the appearance of being invisible and only becoming visible when they were struck by the light rain that was falling at the time. When Cristiano shone his scooter headlight directly on the creatures, they disappeared. They could only see the creatures when it was dark. In the darkness, they still see the contours of their bodies. The boys estimated the creatures to have been about 1.2 meters high, with large black oval-shaped eyes, lacking noses or ears. They had round mouths and their color was dark gray. They had hands with fingers, but were unable to count how many fingers on each hand. All four youths gave identical descriptions of the creature. So this is more yeah. directly, mm -hmm. you know, connected to the UFOs. The boys claim to have watched these weird entities for nearly 40 minutes until suddenly a red laser thing appeared on one of the boys' shirts. And they could see the laser point was coming from some cylindrical object in the field that happened to have smoke coming out of it. Oh, no. Thinking that this may be a firearm of some kind, the boys got the hell out of there fast. They returned to the field a few days later and found that all of the bushes and brush in the area had been turned brown as if they were dead. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, to me, this kind of makes sense that this would be alien, like some kind of alien encounter. I don't know. It just really makes sense to me. And it's interesting, too, that it's like you can see them when it's dark and not when it's light. Like their camouflage works only in the light. Uh, right. Thing. That's like like maybe the lenses or the cameras or whatever they use to be invisible need the light to function. Absolutely. I don't know. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, now let's hop on over to Lon Strickland's website, Phantoms and Monsters, a source we've used from time to time. All right. For encounter stories. I think he lives in the Chicago area. I could be wrong. Oh, nice. This woman was out one day with her dogs, and she was in an area where she was able to kind of take them off their leashes and let them roam around free. And well, here's what she says happened. Several years ago, a colleague who is psychically gifted described an incident she experienced in her backyard the evening before. She had let her dogs out and was standing at the back door while waiting for them to finish their business. As she continued to wait for her dogs, she noticed something approach her on the walkway from the lower yard. Her description was that of, of a tall and wide-shouldered being, but without mass a pixelated, transparent form that continued to move towards her. As this form came near, it abruptly stopped as, as if it were surprised that she was staring at it. Then this form dissipated completely. This was not the first time something of this nature had materialized near her. A similar incident transpired the previous year while she was standing adjacent to her garden. On that occasion, the being was somewhat smaller in form but similarly pixelated and transparent. Her sense of these beings was that it was not a haunting or manifestation by a human spirit. In fact, she had never recognized similar phenomenon previously. In fact, she had never encountered similar phenomenon previously. Her assessment was that these entities were from beyond our dimension and most likely of alien origin. After I listened to the evidence, already having knowledge of her surroundings, I concurred that her experience was more than a manifesting of human energy. So this was a psychic, someone at least with psychic yeah. gifts. Mm -hmm. And was like, nah, 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 this ain't a spirit. This I is a living thing. She can tell. Yeah. Something I think is kind of interesting about this encounter was that she said that it almost was like the entity noticed she was looking at it. Yeah. And kind of stopped in its tracks. Like surprise. Which I kind of find funny. It was almost like, you know, it was going about its business and it was like, oh shit. Right. Which right. I just think is kind of funny because with the other ones, it was more like they were trying to be not seen, but when they were seen, they weren't like, huh? 
Yeah. Like this right. was almost like Burr? Right, right, right. Also the pixelated nature. Yeah. That has come up in a few things in like poltergeist stuff. Yes. Which is kind of interesting. I wonder what that something about the energy or the the waves that are being emitted, I don't know. You're right. Well, another very strange report of an encounter with a predator-like entity can be found on cryptozoology news. This happened to a woman living in western Pennsylvania back in 2000. Her and her husband had recently moved to the area, and you know, to get the to get to know the area better, they decided to take a drive through the forest one evening. You know, it's a lot of dirt roads and stuff, so they're out there in the forest. And mm-hmm. The sun was setting, and the density of the forest made everything you know as dark as night because they're in a th- thick forest. Only the headlights of their vehicle would pierce the darkness. That's when their headlights landed on something that shocked them to their core. As I stared at this shape, I realized I did not know what I was looking at. I knew it wasn't a deer. It wasn't any animal at all. As my brain tried to comprehend what I was looking at, it became more clear the longer I stared. What I saw had the shape of a man, but it was not a man. It was not see-through like a ghost. The only way I can describe it was that it was like standing water, but it didn't cast a shadow. It didn't have any glare to it as the light was on it. It didn't reflect the lights. It was not a gas, as gas does not have a significant shape. Gas will ebb and flow with the breeze, or at least have an inconsistent shape. Rather, what I saw had a defined shape. That was the only way I could describe it because it had the shape of a human and I could make that out because of the defined edges and curves. Only because of its outline was I able to make out what I was looking at. When I realized that I was looking at a human shape, I noticed the posture was similar to a person skulking or sneaking. It was hunched over a little and one of its arms were frozen in place in front of it, as though it knew we saw it and it froze its position to try to be undetectable. Well, for several moments, the creature stands there rigidly still, not taking its eye off the woman. Eventually, it just walked off into the forest and out of sight, almost like it vanished into thin air. Now, while the experience only lasted a few moments, it was enough to rattle the woman to her core and throw her into a panic. She realized she didn't even know if her husband had seen what she had just saw. When she asked if he had, she realized he was pale with shock, and he confirmed he had seen it too. The witness would further say, He saw that it was the shape of a man. He saw that it was hunched over as if caught red-handed. He saw that it was cloaked like the predator, but it didn't have a jagged camouflage look. The thing we saw had a smooth look. It was like standing water without the reflective aspect, and its outside shape was smooth and definitive. I do not know what we saw, but I do know it was real. I've been really guarded about this experience and have only told a few people because I know how skeptics are. I'm one of them. Yet I cannot refute what we saw. It was real. Nevertheless, whatever it was we saw, there is no doubt in my mind or in my husband's. Yes, it was dark, but the spotlight was exceptional with its quality and there was no mistaking what we saw being confused with any shadows or strange light reflections, optical illusions, gas leak, ghosts, or any other possible phenomena. The cloaking abilities were of absolute exceptional clarity. It bent the light in such a way that it looked like the surrounding environment without any flaws save for the outline of the man-slash-humanoid being. Aside from the distinctive outline, we would not have been able to detect that anything was there at all. Now, if light affects the cloak in the daylight, then more people will have more sightings. However, I have a sneaking suspicion that our spotlight defected the cloaking mechanism in such a way that we were able to detect the outline because of it. Wow. Hmm. Something about being able to see the outline is interesting. It's like it can almost be totally invisible, but like not quite. Exactly. Huh. But here's the thing, Maureen. <laughs> like we said before. Oh. Some people say Bigfoot himself will don an invisibility cloak. Oh, fuck. If not Bigfoot, then certainly a Bigfoot-like creature. Linda Godfrey's book, Monsters Among Us, mentions a quote from a farmer who claimed to have encountered one of these Bigfoot entities, saying... The funny thing is that it never left footprints, even in the mud. And when it ran through tall weeds, you couldn't hear anything. And sometimes when you looked at it, it looked like you could see through it, like it was a ghost or something. 
kind of reminds me of of what you were saying at the very beginning of the episode about yeah. how there is you know this work or this this drive to get to the point where it's like you're completely invisible you're right that, like no sound you can put your hand through you all that stuff right and that also goes along with like okay well if you're able to do that are you really even in this dimension does that mean that right. you're in another dimension and then also people say that maybe bigfoot is interdimensional exactly so i mean i don't know does this all make sense i don't know exactly Now, you'll probably notice that some of these encounters took place in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, particularly the state of Washington. And Nick Redfern of Mysterious Universe highlights this quote from the website Native Languages, which reads as such. The Bigfoot figure is common to the folklore of most Northwest Native American tribes. Native American Bigfoot legends usually describe the creatures as around six to nine feet tall, very strong, hairy, uncivilized, and often foul-smelling, usually living in the woods and often foraging at night. In some native stories, Bigfoot may have minor supernatural powers, the ability to turn invisible, for example. But they are always considered physical creatures of the forest, not spirits or ghosts. And that's why I wanted to define that at the top of the show. And you can see similar examples from this in other cultures around the world, like Nepal and Tibet. They have similar things that regard the what we you know what we call the yeti or the Mm -hmm. abominable snowman they have a different name for it but uh similar stories about these entities that even though they're physical material creatures they can still become invisible right right but nick redfern also highlights the more conspiratorial aspects of invisibility cloaks one famous possible example of cloaking technology is a story that we're going to cover separately in its own episode the philadelphia experiments oh of course Many claim that either a cloaking device of some sort or teleportation technology was used to vanish both the USS Eldridge and her crew with absolutely horrifying results. Redfern also mentions the fact that in numerous Men in Black encounters, Men in Black will suddenly just vanish out of sight. And of course, numerous UFO sightings where the craft will suddenly vanish out of sight. Oh, yeah? Is this just cloaking technology? Yeah, that's a great point. And what we see being used is that even if it's humans, are they using alien technology? I wonder. I wonder. I mean, this is so fascinating and weird, and it brings up so many questions. I mean, dang, predator-like entities, man. Yeah. I mean, this is one of those classic Creep Street episodes that I feel like we talk about where it's like, it shows that maybe all of this stuff is connected somehow. The aliens, the interdimensional, the hauntings, the whatever, that everything kind of relates to one another in, in some kind of way. I don't know. It's 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 fascinating. Mm. Well, I'll tell you, I know who's going to listen to this episode. Who? The madman Marcus Hall and the Archduke of Attitude, Adam Archer. Oh, yeah. Both those boys, whoo, they love their action movies. Oh, They yeah. love Predator. I mean, this is right up their alley. And we did an episode with them back a little bit ago about the crow. Oh, so yeah. Th- you know, that doesn't have to do with uh, being invisible, but it does have to do with those those crazy boys. Right. So, Dylan, thank you so much for doing that fantastic research and putting together one hell of an episode. Thank you for expanding our minds. Of course, it was my pleasure. Well, Maureen. Yeah. I got a list of names I wouldn't mind climbing under an invisibility cloak with. <laughs> oh, getting a little getting a little crazy. You know what I'm saying. All right. Folks, give it on up for our top tier Patreon subscribers. Of course, the Dream James Watkins, the Finnish Face Via Lungfist, the Madman Marcus Hall, the Vivacious Vicky McHugh, the Tenacious Teresa Hackworth, the Heartbreak Kid Chris Hackworth, the Oh So Suave, Sean Richardson, the British Bonebreaker Bex Martin, the Notorious Nicholas Barker, the Terrifying Taylor Lashmet, the Count of Cool Cameron Corliss, the Archduke of Attitude Adam Archer, the Sinister Sam Kiker, the Nightmare of New Zealand, Noeline Vivilli, the loathsome Johnny Love, the carnivorous Kevin Bogey, the killer stud Carl Staub, the fire starter Heather Carter, the conqueror Christopher Damien Damaris, the awfully awesome Annie, the murderous Maggie Leach, the surf sexy Sam Hackworth, the evil Elizabeth Riley, Lauren Hellfire, Hernandez Lopez, the maniacal Laura Maynard, the vicious Karen Van Buren, the arch nemesis Aaron Bird, the sadistic Sergio Castillo, the rap scallion Ryan Crumb, the beast Benjamin Huang, the devilish Chris Set, the psycho Sam, the electric Emily Zhang, the ghoulish Gert Hankum, the renegade Corey Ryan. Ramos, the crazed Carlos, the antagonist Andrew Park, the monstrous Michaela Schur, the witchy wonder J.P. Weimer, and the fa 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 freaky Ben Forsyth. 
Oh, my actual goosh. Thank you so much, Dylan, for reading off those names in such a wonderful way because you know what? I love them. I love all of them. Thank you endlessly to our top tier Patreon subscribers. Oof, we just love you so much. Thank you for all that you do. Of course, thank you to all of our Patreon subscribers. You're all beautiful to us. And thank you to every single one of you for listening today. Mm. We love having you be a part of this squad. And if you are a fan of the show, please like, rate, subscribe, share us on social media, talk to your neighbor about us. Um, Maybe just post like a piece of paper on a tree that just says Creep Street. Yes. Oh, we got to mail out all the stickers and buttons to our patrons. We've got to do that. We've got to do that. Those are coming to our Patreon subscribers and we will uh, be putting those on sale hopefully soon for, for everyone. Let's maybe get working on that tonight. Let's get those out there and also, without spoiling anything, there are things in the works. Oh, <laughs> you could say that. There are fun things in the works, and not time. just for Patreon supporters. Oh, yeah. But there are fun things in the works, mm-hmm. and uh, we are excited to share those things. Big time. Citizens of the Milky Way, my name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. Good night, and goodbye. Goodbye.